Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm Laura Kovacs, and I'm pleased to be here. A decades-long activist and writer, Sarah Shulman is the author of more than 20 novels, nonfiction books, screenplays, and stage plays. She's a distinguished professor of the humanities at the College of Staten Island and a fellow at the New York Institute for the Humanities. Based on more than 200 interviews, her new book explores the widespread impact of ACT UP, the diverse community AIDS activist group. A New York Times book review calls the book a masterpiece tome, part sociology, part oral history, part memoir, part call to arms. This evening, she will be joined in conversation with Jason Villamez, editor at the Philadelphia Gay News. Thank you all so much for being here. And now the screen is all yours. Thank you so much, Laura, uh, for having me. Welcome, Sarah, to Philadelphia, at least virtually. Uh, we are so happy to have you and so glad, uh, at least me personally, that you've written this incredible book that um, shows a part of LGBT history and a part of HIV AIDS history that I think people still don't quite understand and don't quite grasp. Uh, and the book does an amazing job at showing that. So I just wanted to start uh, with a uh, sort of a little intro slash history to what ACT UP accomplished uh, during the uh, time you write about in the book, 1987 to 1993. ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, is a diverse nonpartisan group of individuals united in anger and committed to direct action to end the AIDS crisis. Uh, Act of New York began in March 1987. There were meetings every Monday at the LGBT Community Center in New York. Hundreds of people attended them, and they abided by Robert's Rules of Order, um, which, if you haven't heard of that, is a way to uh, sort of keep, keep the flow of a meeting going uh, and to make sure that everyone's voice gets heard. Some of the things that Act Up New York did they designed a fast track system that allowed sick people to access unapproved experimental drugs and they forced the FDA to adapt to it. They ran a successful four year campaign to change the CDC definition of AIDS so women could get access to disability benefits and get included in drug trials. They made needle exchange legal in New York City. They forced changes in medical research and helped refocus research into opportunistic infections rather than a miracle, one pill fixes all. They ended insurance exclusion for people with AIDS. They confronted the Catholic Church in their role in facilitating mass infection. And they worked through the media to help change the face of people with AIDS and public perception. Wow, all of that in seven years. Um, it is, is truly amazing. One of the things that is, is remarkable about the book is that it is based on actual testimony from, correct me if I'm wrong, 185, 186 um, ACT UP members. And when I read the book, I immediately thought of a Belarusian writer named Svetlana Alexievich, um, who does a very similar thing in her books. She takes the testimony of actual people who experienced events, um, and that becomes sort of the crux of the books she writes. Uh, and she says about the process, I've been searching for a literary method that would allow the closest possible approximation to real life. Reality has always attracted me like a magnet. It tortured and hypnotized me. I wanted to capture it on paper. So I immediately appropriated this genre of actual human voices and confessions, witness, evidences, and documents. This is how I hear and see the world as a chorus of individual voices and a collage of everyday details. So Sarah, I'm curious, uh, what did this format allow you to do um, in telling the story of ACT UP that a traditional kind of chronological history book couldn't do? Well, you know, first of all, when Jim Hubbard and I started the ACT UP Oral History Project in 2001, I had no intention of ever writing this book. So we were not thinking about that at all. Uh, just to give a little context. So, you know, ACT UP was founded in 87. It had a split in 92. My, um, in 96 is the protease inhibitors, the good drugs come in. 
1999 is the internet revolution and this left act up in the dust because none of our material was digitized. So at a certain point, like in 1999, if you Googled ACT UP, you wouldn't find very much. In 2001, I was, it, which was then called the 20th anniversary of AIDS, but now we realize it was the 20th anniversary of science noticing AIDS. I was driving and I'm listening to the radio and they're like, it's a 20th anniversary of AIDS. Uh, at first, America had trouble with people with AIDS, but then they came around. And I like almost crashed the car. You know, and I thought, oh no, this is what's gonna happen. There's gonna be this fake progress narrative about the benevolence of the dominant group. And the truth is that thousands of people fought until the day they died to force this country to change against its will. And Jim Hubbard and I had already been collaborating since 1987 when we founded the, the Queer Experimental Film Festival, Mix. And we both had a very strong sense of responsibility to our dead friends. It was something that really drove both of us. So I just called him and I was like, unfortunately, we're gonna have to do something about this. Um, Irvishi Vad, who is one of the great leaders of our movement was at the Ford Foundation at the time. And she gave us money to start the Act of Oral History Project. So in 2001 or 2002, we started interviewing. Now our concept was that we would create this raw data, we would put it up for free, open access, and some academic somewhere would analyze it. You know, we didn't think it through, but we thought, oh, well, people would like to know this information. And in fact, they, they were very happy to have it. We've had 14 million hits on our site. But uh, as time passed, it became clear that this was not happening. Nobody was analyzing the transcripts. And I conducted all but two of the interviews. Jim and I knew what was in the transcripts and we knew it was incredible, that there were all kinds of scoops and amazing pieces of information in there. And it was kind of killing us that nobody was using it really. And then this kind of mishistoricization started. Um, I noticed it when I wrote an article for T Magazine and I said, act up. And the gay male editor corrected it to Larry Kramer's act up. And I was like, oh no, this is a bad sign, <laughs> you know? So that was happening. And then there was other work that came out that really focused on a handful of individuals and did not contextualize them in the larger coalition. And not only was that not accurate, but it gave contemporary activists the wrong impression because, you know, a handful of individuals cannot change create a paradigm shift. Real change in this country is made by collective collectivity, by communities and by coalitions. So um, it became like a state of emergency because a, a false story was being created and it was getting very, very dominant. And we started looking around for someone to write this book. And we like offered all our materials to people. We put people up for grants and everything, but we couldn't find anyone to do it. And finally it was just like, Sarah, you're going to have to do it. So I took three years and I sat down and I reread all the transcripts and wrote the book. And, you know, the first thing I realized was that it could not be chronological because if it was chronological, it would be inaccurate because so many things happened at the same time. And it's the fact that so many things happened at the same time is what made ACT UP one of the things that made it successful and was a consequence of its radical democracy structure. Now, fortunately, I'm a very experienced writer. I've written a lot of novels and I've written experimental work. Some of them are conventionally structured, but some are innovatively structured. And of course, Jim and I spent, you know, many years looking at experimental film and he's an experimental filmmaker. So I had the skill to create a horizontal structure out of all of this material that would convey the values and the, the simultaneity and the reach of ACT UP without trying to approximate a chronology. And that's an important lesson, I think, is that history is not one perspective. It's impossible for one person to see everything that goes on in an event or in a movement. Um, you mentioned the uh, the writer trying to call ACT UP Larry Kramer's ACT UP, and that just made me chuckle a little bit. 
because when you see the the diversity of people included in the book, you really get a appreciation that people came from all backgrounds. Uh, they came from all classes. Um, there's just an incredible mix of people. One of the people who I really took a liking to, at least uh, in terms of how she came across on the page, is uh, Garen's Frankie Ruda. Uh, one of, she was one of the youngest people, I think, in ACT UP. Um, and uh, she had a quote um, about, as you said, the sort of the radical democracy. And she said, uh, this gives me chills whenever I read it. After, after I went to college and started reading these books about the origins of democracy, I was like, you know what? I experienced direct democracy and act up in a way that is so rare in American life because it was a thousand people who came together once a week, every week, and everyone had a vote and everyone was equal and everyone had a voice. That quote gives me chills whenever I read it or say, say it because it's something that you we all sort of wish we had uh, nowadays. Um, and she, she was only 17 when she was in ACT UP, yeah. Remarkable. Uh, she did amazing work with the Countdown 18 Months Project, which helped sort of show uh, shine a light on the importance of treating opportunistic infections rather than trying to find this miracle one pill saves all kind of thing, um, which I want to get to a little bit later. Can Can you set the scene for us about what that radical democracy looked like at a Monday night meeting? Right. Uh, yeah. Well, the first thing is that ACT UP never theorized itself. And a lot of its structure, it just evolved organically and nobody ever decided to do it that way that they did it. They just did it that way. But, you know, it was determined by the needs of people with AIDS and people with AIDS didn't have time to waste. So that really determined the structure of the organization. Uh, so there was no theory, there was no theoretical discussion. There was very little bureaucracy in the organization. Uh, for example, like if they needed someone to write a letter to a commissioner, they'd say like, who's going to write this letter? And somebody would say, I will. And that was it. He would go write it and send it. You know, you never like went over it and moved the commas around and none of that because we didn't have time. So people with AIDS knew what their needs were and their needs were very immediate. And so ACT UP had to be very, very effective and very focused. And so um, as a result of that, it ended up not having a consensus base for, its, for the movement. Not because anyone ever debated it or discussed it. This is something that I have observed and cohered after interviewing so many people, but at the time, no one would have ever used that phrase even. So what that meant was that um, if you, we had a bottom line, and this is very important. There was one, a one line principle of unity, and that was direct action to end the AIDS crisis. And that was direct action as opposed to social service provision. So if you had a proposal that was direct action to end the AIDS crisis, basically you could do it. People would argue with you because it was New York and it was pre-gentrification New York culture and very confrontational and very direct and people would get angry and they would argue. But in the end, if you had an idea and I didn't agree with it, I just wouldn't do it. I wouldn't try to stop you from doing it. I would go find my like-minded people and we would do what we wanted to do. And because of this kind of big, big tent politics, so many things were going on at the same time. It's remarkable. I mean, in so many different kinds of campaigns that were all handled differently and actions that were very different from each other and people in completely different social milieu. And, you know, people didn't even know what each other were doing. Like, when we started interviewing, Jim and I were just like everybody else. We thought that what we and our friends did was act up. And everyone thought that. And no one had an, a broad institutional view. You know, we started piecing it together when we started realizing actually how broad it was. But none of that had ever been mapped. And I think act up also allowed people to really utilize their specific talents. Um, in doing what they wanted to do. Uh, there was a media committee, there was you know, people who did the artwork. Uh, you could sort of choose kind of what niche you wanted, is it correct? Well, yeah, there was, there was an official structure and an unofficial structure. So there was a meeting every Monday night at the Gay and Lesbian Center, which at that time was a crumbling school, old school that hadn't been renovated. And you know, there you saw the official structure. So there was, the media committee, the fundraising committee, 
the Majority Action Committee, which was People of Color and ACT UP. And each committee had a representative to the coordinating committee. It wasn't called a steering committee because nobody wanted to be steered. Their job was to coordinate. And they would set the agenda for the meeting. And then there were facilitators who were elected from the floor. And they tended to be the sexiest, funniest, cutest people. Uh, and they would run the meeting on a loose version of Robert's rules. It was not, you know, um, and according to the agenda that was set. However, there was a completely alternate structure, which was that there were affinity groups. And these were groups of maybe 15 or 20 people that might be organized for one action or might last for years. They would meet separately in somebody's home and they would do basically illegal or theatrical civil disobedience actions uh, that did not have to come to the floor of the public meeting for approval. So they basically did whatever they wanted and ACT UP would provide legal for them. But the reason for this was because people knew that ACT UP was infiltrated by the NYPD and the FBI. And in fact, in the back of my book, I have the FBI file. And you can see that it's true. The people were not paranoid. ACT UP was, was there was a lot of informants in ACT UP. And it's very clear from the file, it's very heavily redacted. And even I, who probably know more cumulatively about ACT UP at this point than anyone, I could not figure out who any of the people were because it's so heavily redacted. But the fear of infiltration was accurate. And I recall um, you mentioned in one of the interviews for the ACT UP Oral History Project that uh, different people had theorized who the FBI informant or informants might have been, but no one actually really wanted to say out loud who they thought it was. People told me off camera, but okay. everyone had a different theory. There was no like common, There, I think there were a lot of informants. And at one point, Barney Frank, who was the gay congressman from Massachusetts in the 90s, and I include this document in the book, he wrote to the FBI and said, look, were these informants agents who you sent in as undercover or were they act up people who were giving information and the answer is very vague and i and i include the answer and you can't really tell but you know in those days you could be arrested for drugs or for some kind of sexual thing and people could trade information to get out of certain kinds of charges so i really don't don't i personally don't have an opinion as to which it was it sounds like in these meetings, uh, you had sort of a person speaking on the floor, but a lot of business could be done on the side or sort of in, in a separate area. Um, I wonder how, how important were sort of those intimate connections within ACT UP, not necessarily with the whole group, but like you had a certain committee or a certain friendship that kind of led to something bigger. Well, you know, movements historically are only successful if joining the movement makes your life better. So if joining the movement means that you're suddenly burdened with all these horrible responsibilities and makes your life worse, that movement is gonna fail. And that's why Emma Goldman famously said, if I can't dance, it's not my revolution, right? So ACT UP was a place that you joined it, your life got better. You know, not only were you able to get information to, that would help you stay alive, but you could get lovers, you could get friends, you could, you know, you could find out your own talents. You could, because don't forget, gay people were very, very oppressed in this period. In the early 80s, there were still sodomy laws. In fact, the Supreme Court did not overturn sodomy law until 2003. And right before ACT UP was founded, the Supreme Court upheld in Bowers v. Hardwick, upheld the sodomy laws. So gay sex was illegal. Even in New York City, there was no gay rights bill. So you could be kicked out of your apartment, fired from a job. You could be denied public accommodation. You could be, you could be kicked out of a restaurant or denied service in a hotel. Familial homophobia was the norm and was absolutely virulent and is a huge force of history. And, you know, street violence against gay people, gay bashing was a form of entertainment where straight people would come into a gay neighborhood and there was no police protection or anything like that because the police were part of the problem, right? So being even a white gay man in the 1980s and certainly being a person with AIDS meant that you were a profoundly oppressed person. And also there was a you know huge amount of guilt around being HIV positive and it, there was a lot of safe sex was invented by Joe Sonnabend and Richard Berkowitz and Michael Callan a few years into the 
the, the crisis, but that was difficult and people were afraid of sex. And then ACT UP happened at a time when everyone was sick of all of that. And it was very sexual and people are bonded for life who are in ACT UP together, you know, even if they don't like each other, they're still bonded. Um, and so, you know, it, it gave people community. And also remember that at that time, this is before legal relationship recognition, gay people had more of a community-based identity. So you, if we had been in privatized family units at that time, I don't think we would have been able to be as successful in fighting AIDS. But we had a collective identity and many people had been forced to leave their countries or their hometowns, their families abandoned them and we had each other and that was it. And that's what the gay community was like. Plus it was New York. So people were very ambitious and driven and people you know, came from all kinds of industries, including graphic design and advertising and media and, you know, and we're really on the cutting edge of those fields and brought all those, all those gifts to ACT UP as well. And it's, it's remarkable uh, because I think, and this is still true, a lot of people still think of HIV AIDS as a white gay male um, illness. And th one of the first things you realize when you read your book and also do some research in, into HIV AIDS is that it is clearly not just a white gay male uh, condition. It is affecting everybody. Um, and I think the, the remarkable thing is that because you had people uh, like Maxine Wolf who had a history in the reproductive rights movement and the women's movement, uh, you had people who were housing advocates that sort of brought sort of a, um, a change in perception to the white gay male people who want to act up thinking, this is just my problem. Then they realized it's affecting everybody and we need, need to work for everybody as well. Well, it wasn't affecting everybody. It wasn't affecting straight men who don't use drugs. And that was a very significant, unless they had a, a, a blood transfusion early on, but that's, that's a significant exception. That's true. And that, that's probably the reason why the media refused to report fairly on, on it. Um, why the church, uh, which is so heavily white, straight, male dominated, uh, did what it did. Um, and so because of that, ACT UP, do, Act Up does these direct actions, uh, many of them. Uh, and I love that you sort of group them together in the book, because as you said, it's a lot easier to take in versus a chronological history, which may jump around. So you get to see the FDA, you get to see Seize the Church, you get to see the NIH, all one after the other. Uh, and I think the power of seeing that is compounded. Uh, and you also see how differently they were organized. Absolutely. There was no formula for organizing a huge action. That's true. And it's, it's such good work and it's a good lesson for organizers today that you have to have flexibility in what you choose to do. So let's let's talk about a little bit uh, the the FDA action, which is the first major action in 1988. Um, you mentioned Urvashi Vade uh, earlier in the conversation. She at the time was the communications person for the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. She did something very interesting that I didn't realize, but makes a lot of sense. Um, she wanted media coverage of this event. She felt it was so important to have coverage across the country, not just in New York. And so she made sure, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there were local people from every major city able to talk about um, not just the action, but HIV AIDS and what it meant to them. So you had sort of that local angle. Yes, Urvashi has always been very brilliant. And this was a brilliant, brilliant media strategy. But it's a little bit even bigger than that. So, you know, Act Up New York was the first Act Up. But other chapters started. We didn't start those other chapters. They just started. So David Barr uh, was one of the leaders of Act Up. He had the idea that to go to the FDA. Now, at the time, people used to go to the White House or the Capitol, the White House or the Capitol. And he was like, no, we should not go to a symbolic place. We should go to the actual place that actually is our problem. And so he picked this place in like Rockville, Maryland, you know, this weird suburb. 
And he and Greg Bordowitz and Deborah Levine and uh, Robert Vasquez Pacheco went to California and met with the, the brand new other chapters. This was the first time that they'd ever had any kind of nationally coordinated anything. And, you know, to get them to come to Washington for this event, to Maryland. So Urvashi and Ann Northrup and Mike Signorelli, you know, Mike came from People Magazine and Ann had been at CBS. So they were doing the media strategy for the action. And Mike started just telling all the journalists, it's going to be bigger than the um, demonstration at the Pentagon during the Vietnam War. He had no, he had, he knew it wasn't going to be bigger. He just kept telling them it was going to be bigger. So all the media came and Mike was like on his uh, loudspeaker saying, person with AIDS from Houston, Texas, meet reporter from the Houston paper over here, person with AIDS from Minneapolis. And this was Irvish's idea. So the next day, there was a local story on page one of every regional newspaper with an interview with someone from that city who had AIDS. And this was the first nationally coordinated media that we had. And it was just, it just was the beginning of the change. Really was. Uh... So flash forward a year later, uh, December 89 is Stop the Church, which I think if, if you haven't heard of ACT UP, you may have heard of Stop the Church because it's been dramatized in I think several Hollywood um, things, not necessarily historically accurate at times, but it has been in a lot of popular culture. Um, and it brings home the point of, of how, um, prohibitive the church was uh, in promoting safe sex, um, in uh, not promoting, uh, I guess, what do you quote unquote, a homosexual lifestyle? Um, well, I mean, this is before the, the pre-sex scandal. So the Catholic Church was at the height of its power. Right. And the Cardinal was in office longer than the mayor of New York, right? So they really like, they ran a part of the city but what they did in this case was activists were trying to get condoms distributed in public schools. And usually the Catholic church would stay in the Catholic schools, but they started trying to get people on, on public school boards to stop condoms from being distributed. And that's when AIDS activists were like, no, this is too much, you cannot do this. And then the Cardinal opposed needle exchange, which was part of ACT UP's agenda. So people decided that they were gonna disrupt mass. Uh, in December 1989. And, you know, I don't know if people can understand what it meant for homosexuals with AIDS to say that they were going to disrupt mass, because part of doing the action was to publicize it. The publicity and the, all the tension around the publicity was part of the action itself. So, um, but there was, there were disagreements inside ACT UP about what this action should be. And, you know, looking back, I think that I think ACT UP was mostly Catholic and Jewish at the time. And there was also a significant Protestant group. But some of the Protestants, I think, I mean, this is my, I can't prove this, but my impression, were didn't want ACT UP to look like an anti-Catholic organization. Now, the Catholics and Jews really didn't care about that. But uh, so the, the, the negotiated agreement was that there was going to be a silent die-in in the church. So everybody goes to have the silent die in and outside there's 7,000 people having this big demonstration. I went inside the church for the silent die in. So you're in there and the Cardinal's in there and it's very tense. And suddenly Michael Petrellis, a member of ACT UP, jumps up on the pew and starts screaming at Cardinal O'Connor, you're killing us in his New Jersey accent. You're killing us, stop it, stop it. And it's chaos. And people are screaming and throwing things and the people are, praying and everything's crazy and the police are there and you know it was like it was not what we had agreed on but actually it made the action because that action was on the front page of so many papers internationally you know it was on tv in the middle east it was on the newspapers in turkey because it was like the gay homosexuals with aids had done this and it was a turning point in terms of gay power. Now, one of the things that's really interesting in the aftermath of this 
is that when ACTIV had their post-action meeting to evaluate, some people were really angry at Michael because he had gone against the group, but never, no one ever suggested kicking him out. No one was ever kicked out. You didn't have the concept of kicking somebody out because we were a community and you don't kick out people from a community. You have to have a supremacy ideology about yourself as clean and pure to be able to say that somebody else should be excluded. And so, you know, that didn't happen. Anyway, years later, I interviewed him for the Active Oral History Project. And I was like, so Michael, why did you do that actually? And his answer was that he had, uh, nobody would let him be in their affinity group because he of his anger issues. And he was so mad about it that when he went to the church, he just exploded. And that's so act up. Because, you know, people were really under pressure in ACT UP. We were very young and a lot of, you know, an AIDS death is a terrible death and people really suffer. And, you know, your friends were suffering and dying and it never ended. And there was a lot of acting out in ACT UP. I mean, somebody stole $10,000, two people OD'd and died. One guy pretended he was positive when he wasn't. You know, Michael did this thing and people kind of, People had feelings about the, each thing and they expressed their feelings, but people kind of understood it because it wasn't respectability politics. And gay people, queer people, and people with AIDS didn't have a concept of themselves as respectable. You know, so it was much more human and much more understanding about where we all were at and what we were going through. Yeah, it's 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 a real sort of testament to um not just the sort of diversity of ACT UP, but the fact that people were sort of forgiving of others, of their differences. And there wasn't a, like, as you said, there wasn't a, a mass kicking out of anybody. Um, well, actually, there was a political party called the, the New Alliance Party that was kicked out because they were trying to take over the organization. Yeah. But no individual was shunned. For the, got it. We have about 10 minutes left. There's so much to talk about. Okay. Um, uh, I want to talk about women in ACT UP um, because uh, the reason the book sort of ends at 1993 is there was kind of a uh, split amongst the leaders of the organization as to what direction the group should go in. Um, one of those quote unquote leaders is Maxine Wolf, uh, who sort of ran the Women's Caucus. And uh, she sort of espoused that um, politics and healthcare are, are one. They are the same thing. So we need to sort of fight for everybody um, that's generalizing. And then you have Mark Harrington of the Treatment and Data Committee, who is very much yeah. in line. So I'm going to stop you yeah. because I don't agree with polarizing it that way. OK. And I don't think I do in the book either. I mean, that, I think that there's a lot of factors and, I'm, and I take a lot of time laying out what happened and why there was a split and there's very complex reasons. But to be really honest, I think that, and I agree with Garan's Frankie Ruda who said this, that I think people just really went crazy because it was so painful hmm. and so many leaders died. And you know, there was a certain point in 92, uh, 93, there were no new drugs and a lot of people were dying. and. So I, th I actually think that had a lot to do with it. But there were political arguments about access. And a lot of that access came down around the question of women with AIDS. And it's not, and so there were some incidents that occurred where the people who were working for women with HIV did not get the support that they need from, the, some, from some of the men, the male, the elite, more elite male leaders. Um, and that created a lot of tension. But I don't know if that's the real reason, necessarily. And I, and I know that people want to say, oh, it's the women against the men, or, but it's not. You know? So I, I, try to, I really try to be more complex in the book, yeah. Yeah, no, there's definitely, it's definitely sort of one group that is like drugs into bodies and another group of various people who are more about reforming the healthcare system um, in a greater way. And those what are men too, yeah. yeah. One of the most moving um, interviews in ACT UP or History Project, I think, is um, Heidi Duro. Mm -hmm. And she sort of says a similar thing that people just were tired by the end. Um, and she, 
is sort of a student of prior direct action movements. And she said in her, in her interview that none of these direct action movements last a super long time because I assume because it's very taxing emotionally and physically to do it. Um, personally, I think, I think everyone being exhausted is the most emotionally satisfying sort of reason why ACT UP split. It makes the most sense uh, because you all did uh, tireless, unforgiving work for seven years uh, with very little support um, and, and honestly, very little money considering everything that you all did, every, every place you all went, um, every action you all did with, with hundreds, thousands of people. Um, so well, I think, our, yeah. our largest action was 7,000 people, but yeah. Stop the church, yeah. It actually was a small group, weirdly, but you're right. And because no one got paid. You know, um, there was an art auction that raised $650,000 and there was a direct mail campaign that's quite controversial, which I go into. Um, but uh, there was, you know, there were, I interview lawyers who did 10,000 cases and they never got paid. So this was people's political work. It wasn't uh, an NGO, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh... Every early LGBT activist would tell you it was it was unpaid work. There was no such thing as paid activism. Uh, a lot of people see HRC nowadays and think, oh, it's a huge industry. And way back when, it was not for anybody, uh, really. Um, just uh, for the audience, uh, we have about five minutes left of conversation. If you have questions, please get them ready. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty based on what we have talked about. Uh, I want to go to close. I just want to make a, actually one note and then a one question. Um, so ACT UP still exists in a lot of areas and ACT UP New York still exists. Uh, ACT UP Philadelphia also still exists. And just to note, because this is a Philadelphia audience, about an hour ago, ACT UP Philadelphia actually was protesting at Mayor Kenny's house uh, because of his um, uh, inability, inability to sort of handle this housing crisis that we have in, this, in uh, the city. Um, Jose DeMarco, who's one of the leaders of ACT UP Philadelphia, continually says that housing is healthcare, uh, housing is HIV AIDS healthcare. Um, so for those of you in the audience, this fight is still going on. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, you please look up these groups on the websites they have, their Facebook pages, uh, and please get involved if you feel compelled. Uh, so one final question. Uh, Maxine Wolf uh, talks a little bit about how much fun uh, ACT UP was, how much sort of joyful living there was. Um, it was tireless work, but also it was a community uh, and people were friends. People did make each other smile. Uh, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, that part of ACT UP. Well, ACT UP was a way of life. And a lot of people that I interviewed really reinforced that. They spent all their time at ACT UP. People in ACT UP lived together. People got in relationships with each other or had sex with each other, partied with each other. They got each other jobs. You know, there were people who were doing ACT UP every day of the week. And I, at that point, you know, very few people really ever joined ACT UP. I mean, it was a vanguard organization, not a mass organization. And most people with AIDS never did anything to fight AIDS. And most people who love somebody with AIDS never did anything but these people did and in a way they were alienated from other people because you know they were they were accomplishing something and a lot of people didn't like act up they thought it was too aggressive and you know but act up really took the position of no business as usual and when you take that position you're giving up your ambition your professional development you know, you're giving up a lot when you're if you're screaming at the new york times you're not going to get hired by the new york times you know, and, and they were facing the reality of what AIDS was. Um, and I think that they, a lot of people were alienated from other people. Um, Ann Northrup, who uh, is, is incredible. She, she does Gay USA with Andy Hum, which for those of you in the audience, it's a wonderful um, gay news kind of roundup of the week. Uh, she mentions um, just the, the, the sense of community and also it was just a lot of really um she says i think she's an attractive people really happy people um and so definitely want to sort of bring that point home is that a lot of the early gay activists as well lgbt activists 
would say that there was joy in the work too. Um, yeah, I want to so, invite people to watch Jim Hubbard's film, United in Anger, A History of ACT UP, which you can skip for free on YouTube and Canopy. And you'll really see, you know, what it felt like to be an ACT UP. Yeah, yeah, pictures, videos, um, always good to, to see. Okay, we have some questions in the Q&A. So mm -hmm. thank you all for your questions. Let's see. Um, Jerry is asking, was Dr. C. Everett Koop an asset or a hindrance? And what it hit, was it his doing or President Reagan's? I don't know. I, I'm not, I don't know that much about Koop, but I will say that he was an anti-abortion leader. And so when he became the Surgeon General, uh, reproductive rights activists were furious. But he tended, he was a little bit better on AIDS than anyone expected, but it wasn't good enough. Yes. Uh, oh, Marty. Yeah. Oh, do you, you can read? Yeah. Yeah. Marty Robinson. So, you know, of the men in ACT, so a, a lot of the women in ACT UP had come from previous movements, like the reproductive rights movement, the feminist women's health movement, the women's peace movement. But of the men, most of the younger men had never been politically active, but the, there were older men who came from gay liberation. And Marty Robinson was one of those people, also like Vito Russo, Mark Rubin, there was a, a, a small group of them. So Marty had been someone who was involved in ZAP actions. And ZAPs were a tactic of the gay liberation movement. In order to do a ZAP, you have to be very alienated from power because a ZAP action is basically like bursting in and fucking everything up. You know, it's not a negotiation. Um, and he belonged to a group that existed before ACT UP called the Lavender Hill Mob. And they did a direct action right before ACT UP was founded where they wore concentration camp uniforms and busted up a meeting of the CDC saying, why aren't you doing anything about AIDS? Uh, and so Marty, there's a, I have a nice photograph of him in the book. He had a lot of influence on younger activists and he died quite early in ACT UP. Let's see, Susan asks, what lessons could be applied to the current political landscape? I think there's a lot to be learned from ACT UP. So one thing is, um, you have to have a bottom line principle of unity, but once you have it, to not demand that everybody agree on the same analysis or the same strategy or the same language or anything like that. You know, to give people a break and allow people to be where they're at and to support people in doing effective actions and running real campaigns from where they're at. So instead of forcing everyone into one box, having this sort of big tent structure where a lot of different kinds of effective actions can go on at once. So I think that's a big lesson from ACT UP. And let me just say like what a campaign, you know, one, something to think about, about running an effective campaign. So ACT UP would design the solutions to the problems. They became the experts. If they were working on needle exchange, they knew everything about policies and laws and about needle exchange. If they were working in housing, they knew all about housing policy. So ACT UP would design a solution that was reasonable, winnable, and doable. And they would present that solution to the powers that be. And that's very different than an infantilized position where you're like asking the government to fix it because they're not gonna fix it, you're gonna fix it. And then when the powers that be would not respond, then ACT UP would do what Dr. King called self-purification or ACT UP called nonviolent civil disobedience training and create theatrical, nonviolent direct actions that would telegraph through the media to the public what the problem was, what the solution was, and the fact that the institution wouldn't do this very reasonable solution. So that's like how you organize a campaign. ACT UP would never just do like uh, a demonstration where people are giving speeches on a stage, everyone's just standing there passively because it doesn't lead to anything. You know, a campaign is something where each thing that you do is a step towards your goal. So I think that could be very helpful. Um, ACT UP did not, was not involved in theory. Maxine Wolf used to say that if you go action first, your theory will emerge because as you are doing your action, you have to make decisions. And as you make those decisions, you have to cohere your values. And so, you know, action comes first and theory follows. Um, another thing is that women and people of color in ACT UP never stopped the action to do uh, consciousness raising about sexism or racism, never. 
what they did was they harnessed the resources of the organization for their constituencies. So as I mentioned earlier, there were some very elite people in ACT UP and ACT UP was able to raise $650,000 at an art auction. So like when the women's committee needed to, to find a way for HIV positive women to be able to travel to testify at hearings and they needed travel and hotel, that money came from ACT UP. Or when the Latino caucus realized that pe people with AIDS in Puerto Rico were abandoned, they got money from ACT UP and went to Puerto Rico and started ACT UP Puerto Rico. So it was just a very smart way of doing things. Um, and there's a lot more lessons in there. Uh, I think on almost you know every section, there's really concrete things that people can take into account. Okay, yes. Um, so ACT UP uh, had nonviolent civil disobedience training. Now I wanna say that ACT UP never committed an act of violence. However, they never decided to be a nonviolent organization. And there was police violence against ACT UP. Uh, there were, you know, there's, there was someone who was permanently, had a permanent brain injury. We have lots of footage of people being attacked by the police. The police were not friends with ACT UP. Um, but almost everyone in ACT UP had civil disobedience training. And that was brought to the organization by people like Jamie Bauer, who had been in the women's peace movement and came to ACT UP already knowing about civil disobedience. And, and everybody was trained. And many people talk about that as a very important part of their participation. It was very empowering. Um, so, and now there's a group called Rise and Resist, I think it's called. That it was an anti-Trump group that came out of ACT UP and people like Alexis Danzig and BC Craig and Jamie, people who were in ACT UP are continuing to do civil disobedience trainings for organizations and movements and really whoever needs it. So that's there. Okay, Joy asks, after putting together the book and revisiting the interviews, was there something that surprised you? The surprise came early when I started to realize, when Jim and I started to realize how broad ACTIVE's reach was. You know, if you look at footage of the Monday night, movie, uh, Monday night meetings, it's predominantly white gay men. And that's true, ACTIVE was predominantly white gay men. But when you start to look at the work that people were doing when they left those meetings, there were people working with getting Haitians with HIV out of Guantanamo. There were people working with incarcerated people with HIV, with, with mothers, who were HIV positive. There was a housing committee that became Housing Works that worked for homeless people with AIDS. There was an insurance coalition. And then there was people working with women with HIV. There were so many different uh, coalitions and sharing and living with and working with people uh, of all races and classes. So that ACTIVE's reach was so much larger than the picture that you see if you only look at the Monday night meeting. And that was something that it was very interesting for me to start to be able to map out and provide evidence for. Did you remember, Sarah, um, your own memories as you were writing books, this book that you had forgotten about your time in ACT UP? No, my, my own memory is now totally corrupted. <laughs> No, seriously, because of, of having talked to so many people. But I was, I was a journalist. I covered AIDS for about five years before ACT UP was even created. And then I wrote a number of early AIDS novels. Um, my novel, People in Trouble, was published in 1990. It's really the first novel about AIDS activism, for example. So I was, you know, I had an AIDS life outside of ACT UP that preceded ACT UP and that continued after ACT UP. So it's something that I never really stopped um, working on. Because don't forget that, you know, when, when AIDS was first identified in 1981, I was 23. And so it really has been my whole adult life. And very few of the journalists who started at the beginning are still alive. So, you know, I think, like I said at the beginning, I think Jim and I always felt that we had a responsibility to make sure this story was told. And I have fulfilled that responsibility. I, I'm really proud of the book. And, you know, there's a lot of people in the book contradict each other and they say things that I don't agree with. And, you know, but that's, that's because that's who, that's who they were. And, 
And what oral history shows you is what people say about their own experiences. And the fact that it's contradictory is just because it's human. If you try to streamline it, you're whitewashing it. And it's not, it's not as truthful as really letting all the flaws show. That's true. And that's why I would encourage anybody watching, uh, if you're interested in it, to go to the ACT UP Oral History Project and read some of the interviews, uh, or as many as you like, of the people in the book, because you'll learn a lot more. But also, um, I think good history makes you ask questions. And so as you re read these transcripts, uh, read this book, you're going to have questions and that's going to lead you to more sources and more things. And it's going to give you a really complete view of everything or a lot of what happened. The book could have been three times as long. You know, in some ways, what I have is almost arbitrary because it's too big to, to represent. And so, you know, it, you can always go back to the interviews, but even those are partial. You know, it, the, how the AIDS crisis affected us and how we affected it is in a way a story that's almost untellable. It's so big. And, you know, that's true of any, any historic cataclysm. And that's why the storytelling just keeps continuing. And I think it's also important to know, uh, as a fellow fiction writer, prose in a book should also be enjoyable to read. And so I'm really happy uh, that you as a fiction writer have written a nonfiction book. Uh, you've written a couple, uh, several nonfiction books, but just for the audience to know, this prose is great. It's, it's, it's easy to read, uh, it's um, to the point. It's also beautifully done, uh, not just because of the words of the interviewees, but the way you've structured the book and the way that you have sort of inserted, as you said, you'll call people out if they're incorrect uh, to make sure that the truth is being told. No, but sometimes, uh, I, sometimes I let it stand also. <laughs> there are people saying things that I don't think are true, but I let it stand sometimes, yeah. Well, I think uh, I think a lot of those people, like that's, that is what they believe. Uh, right. So whether or not it's empirically true, it is true in their mind. That's, that's right. Well, you know, I. As, as an artist myself, I feel that content should dictate form and not the other way around. And when Jim and I went out to try to get some money for the film United in Anger, we went to some film documentary film funders and they were like, a documentary film has to have five characters on a journey. And Jim was like, no, uh, that would not be accurate. This is about the group. And we couldn't get any film money, you know, but all our money came from social justice foundations and from 400 individuals who gave money for the film. But it shows you how funding controls the shape of how stories are told. And so if you tell the story of ACT UP with five people, you're not telling an accurate story. And, you know, and that's why some content really requires innovative, formal approaches. And I know that sometimes they're harder but they're so much more truthful. You know, we're so used to law and order and we're so used to, you know, entertainment and entertainment tells you what you already know and it's very comforting, but art is something that expands what you know and how you know. And so it's so much more valuable. Speaking of entertainment, um, when I was reading the Stop the Church chapter, uh, don't blame me. Uh, my mind went to the show Pose because it was very famous. Um, it got a lot of buzz. I see you you're kind of smirking. Um, they they told their version of, of this action that has nothing to do with the real history. Um, but it's funny because they, it's a fictional show. They could have created their own version of, of anything. Yes. They could have that's the whole point because the writers of po Pose have taken two ACT UP actions and sort of distorted them. And I'm like, because they can't, they, they don't know how to think of a political action. <laughs> you know, so they had to, to kind of distort something that actually occurred. And I was like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. Not only distort, um, in, in real life, the, the condom over the house Correct me if I'm wrong, that was Senator Jesse Helms' house, right? Yeah. So that's big. Senator Jesse Helms was one of the biggest homophobes um, and one of the biggest hindrances to um, LGBT people being accepted on a wider level. 
Um, and on the show, I think they do the condom action on just a random woman's house, like not at the level of a Senator Jesse Helms. So they even diminish the action and its importance. Um, so again, it's a reminder that uh, these fictionalized accounts are not exactly accurate, but um, if you are intrigued by something you see in a movie, please do read, uh, read the real thing, read a nonfiction book. In fact, read Let the Record Show because I think it is the definitive uh, book on ACT UP New York now. Well, there, I just want to say there are more ACT UP books coming out. Peter Staley is having his memoir coming out in September, although he says it's only about him. So it's not, it's not about the movement. Ron Goldberg has a memoir coming out and Garant's Frankie Ruda is writing a book as well. No so there, there will be more, yeah. Oh, good. How, do you know anything about Garant's book? Uh, we had a reading where we all got together and people read from their books. Carl Sondlein is another writer from ACT UP has a novel coming out that he's writing. Dudley Saunders has a novel that he's writing. And, and we all, people read, we all read little excerpts of what we're doing. And you know, it's like, we all see it differently. That's why it's very important to read more than one source. Right. We have a couple minutes left. Uh, so I wanna go to this question of kind of inside outside, um, because I think a lot of today's activists can learn from it. So in ACT UP, you had people who were working directly with um, institutions of power like the FDA, NIH, and you had people on the outside who were actively protesting those same institutions. How did that dynamic work and why was it effective? Well, sometimes they were the same people. And it was sometimes it wasn't really decided to do that. And a lot of people in ACT UP did use the term inside outside, but many people never heard of it. Okay, but basically at that time, the US government was predominantly white and male. I mean, women weren't even in the government, right? And the private sector was dominated by white males and the media was dominated by white males. So even as a white lesbian, there was no one in power who even looked like me at the time. You know, so when, and we had some people in ACT UP who were from very elite backgrounds. So like Larry Kramer had gone to Yale with the head of Bristol Myers, for example. Or so he could get a meeting and then Mark Harrington, who was brilliant and is still the director of TAG, uh, Treatment Action Group, he had gone to Harvard. You know, and Peter Staley had been a stockbroker at JP Morgan. So when they came into a meeting, they were very similar to the guys who were running the government, who were running the private sector, whatever. And for the people who were organizing women with HIV, there was no one like those women in any of these positions. You know, we now have people in Congress, radical people of color, Palestinians, Dominican women, gay, black congressman, there was none of that at the time, right? So, you know, one of the questions I raised in the book is if we had, if there had not been this meeting of the elites, would we have been able to get anything? You know, if we had, if the people that had gone to try to sit at the table, because when the women were trying to fight for women with HIV, it took them two years before they could even get a meeting with Fauci. You know, so it was it was just much more uphill. And I contrast, you know, when you look at some of the different campaigns, the campaign for women, it took four years to get the C CDC to start to serve women with HIV. And by the time that that was won, I mean, it was one, there was a, a law, there was a lawsuit filed by a 29 year old poverty lawyer named Terry McGovern. Uh, you know, the leaders were like very young, you know, people, and by the time that w thing was won, many of the women with HIV who had been leaders in the campaign had died already because it had taken four years. You know, so one of the lessons I think is that you have to pick your strategy based on your social position. You know, your playbook is determined by where you are in relationship to power. And so, yes, you can go have a nice meeting with men who are pretty much like you and they can offer you a catered lunch or whatever and you can negotiate. But if they can't let you in, you have to do messier things. And people did very messy things. And you know, the way that ACT UP won needle exchange in New York City was they defied the law and handed out needles, clean needles and got arrested and did a test case. And that is very risky. <laughs> 
to do that strategy, but they won. And they made needle exchange legal in New York. So, you know, then that's not respectability politics, right? And that those were former and active drug users who did that. So, you know, based on where you are, you can win no matter who you are, but it's going to take longer and it's messier. Uh, ACT UP changed the world for the better. And not enough. <laughs> there, is, there is still to be done, but... Well, I always you know, say that, you know, ACT UP was able to defeat HIV. I mean, not ACT UP, but AIDS activism was able to defeat HIV, but it couldn't defeat capitalism. And this is what we're facing now with COVID. You know, now there's a vaccine, but certain countries can have it and other countries can't afford it. And so clearly it's the same problem. It's like, not only do we not have a coherent and equitable healthcare system in America, we need a global healthcare system. We need a collective global healthcare system where every person in the world can get access to the standard of care. 100%. That's a lesson everyone please take with you uh, because it's still very important. Please, if you're in the audience, read this book. I cannot uh, say enough good things about it. It is very important to a lot of things. I hope if you uh, take anything away from tonight, um, just remember, as Sarah said, uh, you can change things. You just have to be strategic. You have to be smart about it. Act Up did it. And so if you're in an organization, you can do it too. Okay, thank you, everybody. And thank you so much, Jason.